Hello, everybody. Today, we're going to learn about how we do extensive reading with no money and few resources. This uh, video is sponsored by the Extensive Reading Foundation. So if we're talking about an extensive reading environment, um, what would be the ideal uh, ER environment? Um, it's likely that the extensive reading environment would be a library that contains reading materials. There's a borrowing system, a way to check books in, way to check books out. Uh, it'd be located in a certain place, maybe part of the school or a particular room, or maybe the university or school library. Uh, there would be financing. There'll be money to buy books and to replace things, to buy furniture, to buy uh, bookshelves and so on. And there'd be time allocated to reading. We need to have the resources where the reading would be done as part of the curriculum and it would be uh, part of the system of the whole school that the students uh, undertake with their learning. There would be teachers dedicated to support the ER environment, to build the library, find the right materials, to monitor what's being read, and support staff to actually check books in and out and so on. And there'll be some form of uh, external help, maybe from the administration. So in a perfect world, that's what we would uh, have as an extensive reading environment. However, not everybody's lucky enough to have this environment. So the school, which is, I think, uh, one of the main models of extensive reading would be the SEG school, which is in Tokyo. They have 29 classrooms. Each room has between 15 to 25,000 books in each room. And uh, this is an amazing school. If ever you get to Tokyo, uh, please pay a visit to this school. It's, a, it's an exceptional place for graded reading and extensive reading. Um, they do accept visitors. Uh, call them in advance. I've given you the URL there. Um, some graded reading libraries look a little bit like this, where you can see the books are uh, displayed. Um, however, they're not displayed in a very interesting way. They're sort of the spine towards us. We can't see the cover. And the lady behind the desk doesn't look particularly interested in what's going on. So this is probably not an encouraging place to visit. This is probably a little bit better, where the books, some of them are face forward. There's somebody actually engaged, not sitting behind a, a desk you have to go up to. Looks like somebody you can talk to. And there's lots of materials for the students to choose. And it looks a little bit more friendly in this site. This one also is a very extensive library, but again, not particularly interesting because the materials are not really displayed in an interesting way. This is a far better way to display the books. Uh, get them to display uh, forward if you can, so we can see what these things are. And it's encouraging to students to go and pick the book up. Uh, in the previous slides, it's very difficult when the books are um, side on. It's very difficult to know what a good book would be. This is a more interesting environment. So there's a table there. There's maybe a few magazines. There's a carousel of books for you to have a look at. And probably these are the easy books, the middle books, the more difficult books and so on. And quite easy for students to understand what's going on. In my own university library in Okayama, Japan, this is the carousel that we use. And you can see the books have been marked uh, with various colors depending on the levels. So brown is our easiest level. Green is one of our middle levels. Here we have pink books and so on and so on. You can see how the books are organized the students can easily go to the color of reading that they are. Um, in the library, we also indicate which books uh, are various levels. As you can see, we go from the brown level all the way up to the gray level. And we have the books are tagged with pieces of tape so the students can easily find where they are. And we have a, an honesty system for checking books out. We also have an audio library where the, there's a packet with the book and the CD inside and students would check out the packet as well. Uh, we also in my library have a few special books. All of these are read. Notice it's exactly the same story. So we use this as a class reader. All the students will read the same story. We go through it as a kind of serial story like you would watch a TV, a drama or so on. Some of the books are marked with a gold sticker uh, or a little star to show that they are very popular so other students can know uh, quickly which are the good books to choose. 
However, as I said, this is a perfect environment. And the problem for most people or many people, they have no money or no materials, very little support from the staff or from other people around. Uh, maybe people have heard about extensive reading at a conference, but they don't really have people in their area to help them. They don't really have an idea what to do. They don't really have time in the curriculum or space to put books, uh, no library space and no book borrowing systems at all. So there's often all kinds of issues that many people will face. And today I'm going to, to provide some of these solutions or possible solutions for you. The first one to look at is uh, resources in terms of class time. So it, often extensive reading is not allowed to be part of the curriculum for many, many uh, often understandable reasons. So uh, this might be that the school itself feels that uh, the identity of the school is more focused on communication or it's more focused on tests or it's more focused on something else. And they feel that, you know, extensive reading is an unnecessary burden, it's expensive and so on, yeah, unfortunately. But you know that extensive reading is important. So one way you can bring extensive reading into the school environment is to create maybe a reading club. You could have library treasure hunts where the students would go and hunt for books that they like. Uh, you would have uh, activity like go and find a book that's about a whale and they will go and find that book. And then by looking in the library, they may find books that they like. Or you could assign the reading for summer homework. If you don't have space to put the books, uh, if you do have books, you if you're not allowed to use the school library area for whatever reason, maybe there's not enough staff or there's not enough shelf space or whatever reason, then another way for you to hold your library is to put it into a cart the problem with a cart, of course, is that people can take the books too easily and some of them will go missing. I would strongly advise that you lock it up in a cupboard or put it in some kind of a suitcase with a little zip and a lock on it so you can wheel it to and from the classroom easily. All of your instant extensive eating library is sitting in the suitcase like that with your checkout sheets and everything. And if you have five or six of these suitcases labeled A, B, C, D, uh, then you can uh, rotate them between classes uh, every week. Sometimes students, uh, bigger pun, teachers are not um, devoted to the ER program. Uh, there's a lack of staff. Um, so you're going to need some help to do this. Uh, help in choosing the books for the library, maybe making text or tests for the students. You need some help building a library or, or buying books, uh, anywhere from buying books to finding a location, setting up borrowing systems and keeping them running, monitoring the students reading. So all of these jobs need to be done at some point as part of the management of the extensive reading library. So other ways to do, to do this is to use upper class students to help. So get them, the students who've already done extensive reading, get a few volunteers to come and help um, and use that as an activity so that the students can go from one class to the other, give the upper class students responsibility to take care of the library or to be buddy readers to help the, the lower ability students to read better. You might want to enlist parents or other teachers to help you um, or ask and require volunteers to run the library. You might ask an outside a mother or father could come along to help, a retired grandparent might want to help. And they could help checking materials in and out or making book displays and so on. So there are often other ways. And of course, that depends on your environment. Your school may not want or may not need, may not allow these people into the school. So you'll have to check that out. One of the main issues is money. Um, I have been very lucky to consult to quite a lot of schools throughout, particularly Asia, but globally helping them. And I generally find that money isn't a problem, um, or at least not as big a problem as people think it is. Because in every school that I've been to, to help, there's always been money, maybe a lot of, lot of, lot of money, but there's always some money. And there's money um, in places which you just need to look for and look carefully for. In every school I've been to, the school principal always has a secret emergency fund. That's part of their budget. So does local government. And so you just have to find a way to get to that secret emergency fund. 
Another way to get funding is to set up a research project. Speak to your school principal or a ministry of education or a local city board and say, I want to do a reading research project. Could I please have some money for some books? And sometimes you'll be lucky to get that. You could approach a government department with a video of your school showing how hard your students work, but then we're showing that we have empty shelves. We don't have books to read. And, you know, we could then um, make the, uh, the, you know, make the government department understand just what kind of an issue there is for, uh, for reading in your school. Another one is to ask students to do what we call a readathon. A readathon is where students are sponsored to read, read. So for example, let's use US dollars. I think we all know US dollars, maybe one cent per page. Every page they read, somebody will sponsor them and they'll say, I'll pay you one cent for every page you read, or I'll pay you two cents for every page you read. And students get one day and they just read for maybe five hours or 10 hours or something, count the number of pages and then get the money from the, you know, the parents or brothers or sisters or aunts or whatever. And that money can be used for uh, funds. Again, your school may or may not allow that. Uh, do check that out with your school first. Another way to do this is, particularly in fee-paying schools, is to ask parents to pay a small fee. Just say, could you please give us $5 or $10 to buy one book uh, to subsidize the library? Or just increase the fees by, say, 0.1%. Um, over the years, it will build a library. And I found in my experience that asking parents to, to donate money for the school for educational purposes, a lot of parents are willing to spend that money because they know it's going to be useful. So I think it's important that, uh, that we, we bring the parents into this as well. Another way to get money is to ask for book donations from home. So maybe uh, you could ask your students to ask their parents or their grandparents, mom, dad, do you have any old English books? Do you have any books that you've got? Um, maybe go to a, um, the a, a local library or a local company and ask them to donate some money in return for advertising. Maybe one of the parents uh, of the children um, is a manager of a, of a company. Go and approach the manager and say, could you please sponsor us for a few hundred dollars for some books and we'll put your name on the, uh, on the library. And that's a win for the local company and also a win for the school. Another way that some schools do this is they have a vending machine where they sell things like water or some sort of juice or some snacks or something, um, hopefully something healthy. Um, and the money from that, the profit from that goes towards the library. Um, you could make a call for donations from parents with an attractive flyer. Um, Parents also can donate, not necessarily money, it could be something they don't need, maybe some, an old sweater or maybe something from the garden or something that they've made, uh, an old table. They could donate that to the school and then hold a sale, maybe on the sports day or the school festival day, have a corner of the playground where there are things for sale and people can come and buy these things and you keep the money and build a library. You could ask volunteers to do things for payment. So for example, you could ask your students, if they choose to, if their parents allow, to volunteer, say, uh, pick weeds or sell lemonade, make homemade cookies, do some odd jobs around the place. And any money that they get, they, you could ask the students to donate, let's say 10%, 50% or all of their money uh, from that. And so the students, by building up their, their resources this way, feel more engaged with the actual uh, library itself. Another way to get money is through the Extensive Reading Foundation. If you go to the ERF website, you can see the link there. The ERF does have grants. Uh, several thousand dollars a year are given to schools all over the world. Um, and you have to apply for funding. Uh, the funding can come from an individual or from an institution. And the money is given to conduct research into the extensive reading approach, um, or to conduct a project to promote extensive reading, or to support the creation of model extensive reading programs. So applications can be uh, sent to the ERF grant committee from all regions of the world, except for those countries classified as high income. So Japan, for example, would not be allowed. Um, preference is given to projects which will reach beyond, reach beyond the group 
by requesting uh, requesting funding, uh, by setting a model that would inspire others. However, there are lots of applications for this, so you need a good case. The ERF is very likely to send the money to, uh, will not send money, it will send books, for example. Uh, we will ask a bookseller to deliver books and we'll want something back from you. We will want photos, maybe something on a website, maybe a video of the books being used and so on and so on. So the ERF want to validate that the books are actually being used. Other government grant organizations include the ones that you can see here. Uh, the Australian government is particularly active. RELO, the, re the American uh, Regional Language Office is very helpful. New Zealand and various other organizations. You can go and approach them. They often have money to donate. If you're looking for support, uh, a different type of resource, you just simply don't know, you don't have enough information, um, do read the free guides to extensive reading, which are on the ERF website. Uh, we have a, a guidebook, which is freely downloadable, which you can learn a lot about extensive reading from. There are often people in your area, so you might want to connect to a Facebook page or maybe to um, one of the very many uh, ER associations we have. We have affiliate organizations in uh, China, in uh, Taiwan, uh, Korea, uh, Indonesia, uh, Middle East, Europe, and other places. And we have them forming in places like Malaysia, Thailand, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and so on. So there are quite a lot of these places um, who are developing uh, ER associations. And many have uh, very active ER Facebook pages like Vietnam, for example. Indonesia has a very active Facebook page. These are the guides which you could look at. So there are ones in English and in many different languages. For example, here we have uh, Japanese, Arabic, Arabic, Indonesian, Korean, and so on and so on. These are freely downloadable from the address that you can see there. So this will give you some background information. You should also look at this YouTube website uh, from the ER Foundation. There are probably a hundred or so videos for you to have a look at to get information. The next big thing is to get resources. You need actual materials. You need reading materials. So one way to do that is to beg for it um, in a nice way. So some publishers in some countries are very generous. If you go to a conference and you go to up, up to them and say, I really like your reading materials, do you have a sample copy? They may give you a book. And if you go to several of the publishers, you may get four or five books which you can take back to your library. Um, sometimes the ERF give free book giveaways. Uh, when we hold our conferences, we often generate some money and we get some books which are donated by publishers, which you can give away. The last World Congress we held in Taiwan, we gave away several hundred books for people to take home. Um, sometimes book raffles are on offer. Sometimes you have friends or older people um, for old or spare copies of their books. Maybe you know someone who is lucky to live in a, or work in a, in a resource rich school. They have many books and they've had them for many years, but some of their books are getting a little bit old. Some pages are missing. They maybe want to throw them out. You could say, excuse me, could I have them please? And you can maybe fix up these books. So that's another way you could do that. Sometimes libraries throw away books and you might want to ask them if they have any books that you can, you and your students could maybe repair. As I said before, you can ask for donations. And again, uh, people do ask the publishers, Oxford or Cengage or Macmillan, uh, Cambridge and so on, do sometimes sponsor research projects uh, in return for a report on the material. So these are different ways you can get for material. So if you want to do a research project, you'll say, publisher, could you please give me 50 books? I'm going to use them in my class. I'll give you a report on the uh, use of the books later. Another one is to borrow materials. So sometimes a school has a small library, but if you change your exchange libraries with another school, um, you could then share the other school's library and you could rotate it. Maybe once a month you share books between say three or four different schools, it means that the students are getting greater access to more materials. You could also, if you're very lucky, maybe borrow books from the local city library. 
Um, some libraries are very generous and they will allow you to uh, borrow 50 or 100 books to take to the school, but of course you have to take them back again. So you have to be very, very careful. Sometimes there are local book clubs that you can get involved with uh, in your area and ask if you can borrow some of their books. People who do belong to book clubs often have lots of books and some of their books are not being used anymore. Maybe they could ask, you could ask them to donate them. The next one is if you do have materials, you're going to need to make resources to check and make sure that the books are coming back again. So you may need to make some reading record sheets. And there's two different ways to do this by paper. One which is have a single piece of paper where you have all the students' names down here and the name, the dates across the top here. Inside the cover of each book, you'll put a little code. So maybe the book is a yellow book, or maybe it's a pink book, or maybe it's a green book. And you could have the colors there and put the number, the unique number for each book in there. And you can see um, which, which student has borrowed which book. And when they're crossed out, the book has come back again. So we can see, for example, that Miguel still has to return the book from May 23rd. That's one way to do it. It has one piece of paper for the class. Another way to do that is to have one piece of paper per student. So this is Fukumoko, Fukumoto Aya's book. Uh, book reading record. She writes down on here which book she's read, what the book number was, when and when she borrowed it, how long it was, and maybe some kind of a comment. So every week when she's changing her book, the student would fill in this form so you can see, you know, the level of the book the student's reading and how much they read and whether they like it or not. If you don't have materials, one thing you could do is to modify existing materials. And this is something that I've done with my students for many, many years now, is you ask the students to find something that they like on the internet. So this particular student, her name is Yuka. She found a text on the Tasmanian devil. Now this was rather difficult for her. So what she did was for homework, she took, she printed out the text and she wrote on it. She used her dictionary, and she looked up all of these words she didn't know. And as you can see, she wrote in Japanese on the actual text itself. The next day, she brings the book, the beg your pardon, this paper to school, and she explains to two or three other students about the text. She read about the Tasmanian devil, and hopefully she's using some of these new words in her uh, presentation to the other students. When she's finished speaking, Yuka then gives that Tasmanian devil paper to her friend. Her friend now reads it. Notice what's happening here, that the friend now is reading it with the Japanese translations. This makes it easier for the second person to read. Then if the second person reads it and there's a word of something that they don't know, they are also allowed to write on Yuka's paper and to then um, add the definition or something that they don't know. This paper is then given to a third person and a fourth person and so on and so on. So by the time the fourth person is reading this, the text is probably being made simple for other people and they can read it reasonably smoothly with two, without too much inter interruption. And if you keep these papers in good condition and if the students are getting one or two of these per week, by the end of the semester, if you have 20 or 30 students in your class, you'll have hundreds of student interest, student selected, student graded work, and you have done absolutely nothing, but you've got an instant uh, kind of translated extensive reading library, and that might be very useful. And the best, most popular texts, you can keep them for the next year and the year after and the year after if the students allow you to keep them. Here's some more examples. Uh, that was the Tasmanian devil. This is a recipe. This is a newspaper article and this is a web page. So as I say, the students do all the work for this. All you have to do is just monitor. If they're having any trouble, then you could uh, help them. You might even want to allow them five or 10 minutes in class to actually do the translation. This is another example also. Um, what you could also do as a teacher, if you're looking for materials and let's say you know that your students really love travel, and one student really wants to go to the Maldives, so you can find a text about the Maldives, like this one. 
The problem is that this text is a little too difficult for the student. So what do you do? Well, you can select the text from the web page, then go to some place called the Online Graded Text Editor. That is at ercentral.com, ercentral.com. What you then do is you take the text and you paste it into there. What this does is it allows you to see which words are difficult for the students. If you set the level, let's say your students are at that middle intermediate level, paste that in and all of the items which are black with red underline means that they are in the word list, but at the wrong level. The ones which are red are outside the word level. The pink ones are proper nouns. What this does is it shows you very quickly which words probably maybe you want to edit. So these underlined words, you might want to change it. So you might want to change it, uh, may very well be one of the easiest, may be just delete well there. Or this one, London Life's great bucket list. Maybe you don't know what a bucket list would be or like a great list of things to do. So you could edit this. And this online graded text edit, it can help you to generate texts by showing you some words that you might want to edit. Another way that you can use uh, ercentral.com is to use the feature called Text Helper. Again, what's, what, what we have to do here is uh, this is a website for, for students. This one is for teachers. Teachers use this to bring in text for the students. This one is for students. Students find a text that they don't know they paste the text into Text Helper, and then they can see the translations for all of the words outside their level. And that's the way that it looks here. So this is a student is learning Japanese. This is her level. She pastes the text in. Here are all the words out of her level and all of the words that she doesn't know. So she can read it with the translations next to it. If she is registered with ER Central, which is free, she can then add these words to then learn later in ER Central. So this is another way to have free reading materials simplified for the students. Another way to do this is for you to write your own materials. Um, if you wanted to write your materials, you could use the online graded text editor that I mentioned before, or you could have upper class students, maybe in a writing class, could write stories which could be read by lower classes. So you may want to have a creative writing class, for example, get students to make stories, which then uh, lower level students can then read. Or if you want to, you can write your own um, or team up with some friends. So you don't have to write stories. You could write nonfiction materials. That's perfectly fine. And if you're interested in writing graded reading material, um, here ha there is a link for you for some hints about what to do. If you are very keen about wanting to publish your own material, xreading.com allows people to publish uh, their own books. Um, this is for people who are interested in publishing their own books, who are very serious about writing materials. And uh, xreading will allow you to put them onto the website, provided they're of sufficient quality, and will allow you to be paid for that work. So please contact xreading.com if you want to learn a little bit more. Now, there are also lots and lots of free materials uh, where available on the internet. And I know that many of you have been looking for free materials on the internet. I mentioned ER Central before, um, but there are many free websites that offer free reading materials. There's a lot of good material out there, and you, so please use it. However, free does not always mean good. It's quite clear to me that commercially produced books and graded readers will almost always be better as they've had a proper editing and have been properly produced by professionals. Many websites is just somebody who loves reading, who doesn't really know how to write materials well, and they just make a website. Now, the materials may be okay, but it's unlikely that they're going to be very systematically made and probably would have rather random vocabulary use, whereas commercially produced materials uh, by the major publishers and professional writers probably will be better. 
please be careful with pirated copies. Borrowing uh, material or taking material from the internet, where, for example, maybe you've got a Macmillan book or a, a Oxford book or something like that, and somebody's made a PDF. Uh, these are often poor quality in the way that they are written. They've sometimes got markings in them. The printing is often not very clear. To be honest, they're very hard to read on a screen. If you've got a PDF on a small smartphone, it's very, very hard to read. A lot of you know, moving the text around and expanding and reducing it, it's very, very hard to read. Even, to be honest, students hate these things. The other thing too is that students know they're being copied. There's an issue there in terms of integrity and teacher integrity and the message that we give to our students. If the students know that the teacher copied from a website, it gives the message that stealing is okay because my teacher did it. And that really isn't a message that we want to be giving to our students. So please try to avoid using pirated copies as much as you possibly can. So I'm going to now go through a, a long, long list of reading material, which is said to be free. I'm not going to introduce each one of these things, uh, but what I will do is I'll very quickly scan through this. So please stop the video at any point in this where you feel you want to note down an address. Um, so here are a few, freegradedreaders.com, ELI graded readers, you've got the address there. Here are examples of the way that ELI graded readers uh, these are viewable online. You can't download them, but you can actually read them online. They're very generous to allow you to do that. This website has some free graded readers. I'm not sure of the quality of these things, but you can see the link. This is an example of one of the stories there. They're trying quite hard with some text and illustrations, and that's a good thing. This was written by Paul Nation and, uh, so he's allowed people to use these materials. This website has graded reading comprehension activities and you can see some there. This is the type of activity that they've got. Very often these are short texts with follow-up questions and so on. Uh, probably they're better for teachers to print out and bring to class, but that's not really extensive reading. That's more like class reading. Breaking News English is a very, very popular site. They have new texts almost every day on many, many, many different topics. And if you like news and you like your students to understand the news, this is a great place for students to go to. And as you can see here, they have the article itself. And there are many different activities, often up to 15 or 20 different activities that you can do as a teacher. So we have the main activity, and all of these activities that follow up. So I'm not going to show you all of these, but you can see here there's a warm up, vocabulary, there's before reading questions, there's gap fill activities, listening activities, comprehension questions, multiple choice questions, role plays, language activities, spelling activities, dating app surveys, lots and lots and lots and lots of different activities, including writing activities for almost every activity on Break News English. This is a wonderful resource. It's very likely though, that this is probably more on the intensive side. You don't have to do the activities, but there's still some useful text for your students to have a look at. I think the disadvantage of this is it doesn't have a login. So you don't know which students have read which texts. This is another ESL website, uh, more focused on American students rather than uh, students in EFL countries. The English Club also has some, here are some sort, short stories. There is Five Minute English also has some texts. Global Access at Bow Valley College has some great texts. My English Pages also has some materials. And this is an example that has a, a video that comes with it. So that might be useful for your students as well. ESL Lounge has a few texts. Here's one called Tom's Day. Bilingual Kids Spot also have lots of materials for students to have a look at. Learning English, BBC Learning English has student materials. Um, 
this particular website here is called English e-reader. Unfortunately, most of the material on this website has been pirated. It's been taken from Oxford or Macmillan or somewhere else, and they put a new cover on it. Um, and they want you to read it and pay for the, the pay them by um, watching the adverts. In the University of uh, Wellington in New Zealand, uh, they have some free graded readers available for you. Uh, this Learn English Teens at the British Council also has some reading material for you. ESLbit.net, Learn English with VOA News has lots of material. This is probably more ESL, more focused on students studying English in America. Gutenberg has lots of texts, thousands of texts. However, they're all native level material. These may be stories which are 100 years old or 150 years old that are now out of copyright that you can take. And in my experience, many students don't like to read a 400 page Russian novel as part of their learning of English. Read Theory is another website. So there are some good points about uh, free graded reading sites. The big thing is, the big positives, the thumbs up is that they're free and it's reading practice. And there are some interesting materials. However, there are quite a few problems with free graded reading sites as well. They're free. And the people who write this material don't often get paid. So because they're not being paid, they're probably not spending the time or the effort making good quality materials. Quite a lot of this stuff is for ESL. The, that means there's an assumption that the students are actually meeting English outside the classroom as well as inside the classroom. Where in EFL, in countries like say, uh, Thailand or Indonesia or China or uh, Malaysia, there's not much English outside the classroom. So therefore, those materials are maybe not always so useful. Sometimes the students can dis get distracted by ads. There's lots of distractions on the web pages and they can easily click away. And very often the websites are a little bit not so interesting for design or layout. Sometimes the topics are boring and they have a very limited number of texts. So um, the quality of it is quite varied and randomly selected. You know, there's often lots on travel, but there's not much on, you'd say, other topics. Some of the texts are very, very short. Maybe they're only 50 words or 100 words long. So there's a lot of clicking going on. It's very hard for the students to remember what did I read, what did I not read. Um, there's, no, uh, there's no particular system to build on previous knowledge. And as we all know, in extensive reading, we need to build on previous knowledge. We should not only be just doing random reading. It should be systematically building on previous knowledge. And if there's no login, it's very hard for the teachers to track and the students to track what they've read and what they've not read and to find materials again, right? If students are dealing with five or six or eight websites, it's very, very hard for them to keep a record of what they've been doing. So uh, it's very hard to record what the students have done. The teacher cannot track what the students have been doing in any way. So we need a different solution. So if you're choosing an online reading website for your students, you have to ask these questions. Number one, does it have enough materials? Are the materials leveled properly? Can the students easily find their level of their material? Is there a level test, for example, to find out what level they are? Are there different ways to use the reading? Can they listen and read? Is there a speed reading activity? So if you look at the materials, do you think your students would actually enjoy the reading or are they just going through the process? Are the stories on the website well written and interesting? And very importantly, as a teacher, can you track what they've been reading so you can actually follow up on that been reading and check how much they've read, whether they've understood, whether they pass any tests or not. So one website that you can do that and here, full disclosure, this is my own website. Uh, my name is Rob Waring and I own and run this website. However, this is a totally free website. The website has been made with my own money and with my own time. There are a few adverts on the website, but honestly, the money that comes in from the adverts doesn't even come close to even paying for the data charges that I have to pay every month. Nevertheless, uh, the website is out there and available for you to use. 
there's a student area and there's a teacher area. Um, in the teacher area, there's lots of information about how to do extensive reading. And there's also a place for you to log in and to manage your students. So what you do is you set up your institution, you register your students, you tell the students the ID and the password, students log in, do their reading, and then you download the data. And you can do all of that here on ER Central. So the reading library would look like this. There were students who would choose a particular text. They would open the text, they would see some information about it, and they can bookmark it to keep it for later, or they can just read the text. They read the text, uh, the text is here, and any word that they get, they can click on and they can find any word that they don't know. There's a built-in dictionary already in the system. And uh, the system keeps a record of um, what they've been reading and they can easily click back. When they finish the reading, they have the opportunity to rate the material. This is very useful because other students can see if they liked it or didn't like it, it was easy or difficult. And that helps other students choose the right material. So the popular material gets shown to the top of the list. The students also have the option of taking a quiz. And here they would take a quiz, uh, five or eight questions they can take. This is optional. You can ask them to do it or not do it. There's also a listening library where the students, again, have a similar type of approach. They can choose the text that they like at their various level or in various genres. And the big difference is they just play the text and they can listen and read. So this is listening while reading. Or if they want to, they can just look away and just listen or listen while reading. There's also practice for speed reading. And here the students would choose a text. They say, go, and then they would um, start the reading and then they time themselves when they finish. And this says they read it 578 words per minute, which is of course crazy fast. Nobody can read all of this passage in 10 minutes. This is just uh, me being lazy with this slide. The next um, thing we can look at here is, I have for you a QR code. If you're interested in using ER Central, uh, go, to the ER, to the, go to that QR code and it will teach you how to set up your students on ER Central. So as an extensive reading teacher, what are your next steps? Well, what I would suggest you do is try extensive reading with a few students informally, maybe in a book club, get some books, uh, get some feedback on it, learn what students like, what they don't like, what materials are good for them, what are not good for them, which of all the ideas that I've given you today are useful, and go through some of the troubles they've got. And all this is part of planning for the bigger rollout of your extensive reading program across several classes. So try it informally with just a few students or maybe for one class. Ask for a budget for a trial class or group of classes, maybe second year students or first year students. Start to integrate the ER into a class. Make it positive, supportive. Bring in more activities. Make it part of the curriculum, maybe part of the assessment. Get other teachers involved as well. And then when you're happy with it, when you've learned the mistakes, when you know what to do, when you have um, been able to learn about how to do extensive reading and what you should do, what you should avoid, what you know, you bring to a full rollout in the school where maybe the whole school or a whole school year would uh, then uh, have a full ER program where you have a formal library with your school with proper checkouts. Um, and uh, you might do some research on the amount of that's read speed reading gains and so on, and maybe report this informally at a conference or write an article about it so that other people would know. So these are some steps that you can take, but don't hurry these steps. Um, definitely learn to make your mistakes with extensive reading before you roll it out. Because if you roll out extensive reading to a wide range of students and you make mistakes, you introduce it too quickly, to uh, maybe in the wrong way, too much reading, not enough reading, the wrong materials, you're going to get pushed back. And the heads of the school will realize that it wasn't successful and they will just cancel your program. So make sure you learn how to do your program yourself first. So another thing I want you to be aware of is why do extensive reading programs fail? The first is that often uh, it's optional, therefore the students will opt out. Um, so therefore we should require extensive reading. 
very often an ER program may fail because there's a curriculum change. So, you know, for example, maybe you've moved from cumulative language teaching, you've decided that your school wants to improve test scores. Or the extensive reading enthusiast, the one who set up the program has left the school. Uh, therefore, uh, the system collapses because all the knowledge was in one teacher's head. Therefore, you need to make sure that ER is part of the curriculum so it continues and it's bigger than a single person. A major reason the ER program would fail is the reading is too difficult or too boring, age inappropriate. So therefore get better books, spend some time talking to your students and finding out from other teachers and other people, what are the best books? And as I said before in the previous slide, be careful of starting too fast, too high, too much to read too soon. Involve everybody. Unfortunately, the reality is there will always be somebody who doesn't like extensive reading. They'll think that it's childish or useless. They can't understand why your students are reading such easy books. They don't understand why. Then you're not teaching grammar uh, and cannot understand why fluency is so important. So there'll always be somebody in your school who doesn't get it. Unfortunately, if they're in a position of power, they may make it very, very difficult for you. So you need to make sure that these people are convinced. Uh, make sure that everybody knows why you're reading and why you're doing this. So that's the end of this presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you want to find out more, please go to the Extensive Reading Foundation website where you can learn much more about extensive reading. Please continue to look at the ER Foundation YouTube channel. There are um, dozens and dozens of more videos on extensive reading. Thank you very much for your time today.